Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to our audience watching live online to this last issue briefing of the World Economic Forum on Africa 2015, our 25th annual meeting for Africa. Now, this one is uh, the discussion we'll be having, which will be hopefully as fluid and organic as we can, with questions coming via social media as well, is on one of the most important subjects we've been discussing here. It's on skills, it's on technology, it's on how technology can drive sustainable growth, entrepreneurism, get skills moving, get African students and workers moving and make them viable and valuable in the global marketplace. I have two uh, very esteemed experts here to take questions and to offer their insights. First of all, Stephen Van Collar, the CEO of Corporate Investment Banking, Barclays Africa. Uh, Vikas Potter, Chief Executive of the Varki Foundation based in the UAE. Um, I'm going to just um, keep my comments, as always, to a minimum and, and let Stephen just jump right in there. Stephen, leaders discuss technology unlocking growth and driving entrepreneurship, but what's the role of a bank in, in doing this? Um, if you have a look at what's driving change in banking, especially around payments, it's all about technology. Um, and so banks are having to, being forced to um, just put this highly on their agenda. The beauty of it is that as you get more and more technology into your, your banking system, the costs go down and that uh, creates ability for more financial inclusion to get more people involved in the banking system. It also allows you to use data uh, on a far more um, dynamic basis, which allows you to forward looking dynamically credit score people as, as opposed to what we've done in the past. You could only credit score them on um, a historical basis and that makes it very difficult to go you know, down the, uh, the sort of uh, a food chain in terms of you know, giving people banking. So I think it's absolutely critical. If you just have a look at Alibaba, they're you know, charging what 0.18% per, per transaction. You know, we have to get on that bandwagon otherwise maybe they'll be the next bank. So financial inclusion is one thing, but what about elsewhere, capital markets, getting, getting, getting markets moving? One of the things we talk about uh, alongside <coughs> inclusion uh, at the consumer level is, 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 is um, enabling Africa's markets. In fact, it's one of the pillars of this, of this meeting. Yeah, um, if you have a look at what happened in um, South Africa post-apartheid, so post-1994, if you go back just uh, 20 years, in that time, the bond markets have uh, increased tenfold, the equity markets eightfold, and th it's that type of liquidity you need to bring into all these financial markets. And so working with government to link both the institutions and the, the corporates and, and, and the government institutions is uh, critical. One of the key roles parastatals and um, sort of government pension funds can play is they are sort of the cornerstones of financial markets uh, and um, trying to make sure that their mandates allow them to um, uh, you know trade in, in in government bonds or trade in corporate bonds or you know be market makers is going to be absolutely critical so we're doing a lot of work with that with um, those type of institutions at the moment to try and make sure these these liquidity pools in, increase just move on to skills what, what kind of work can, and what work can you do? We talk about public-private cooperation, but what kind of what kind of work is is Barclays Africa doing um, in in with regards to developing skills on the continent? So there's there's a few things we do. Um, clearly, uh, as you go um, first into South Africa, then from South Africa out, you you're trying to take your your, your global skills and put them in these markets so that you can actually develop them. So what we do is we take a lot of our staff, move them out of the continent for, you know, weeks, months, years, and then bring them back again. And so there's a there's a continual flow because over time, as, as you're building a business, you want it to be 99% local uh, because they understand the market, they understand the government, they understand what's the um, uh, uh, clients. But it, as you move in, you want to bring the skills in you want to do the training, you want to move them out. So we have a expat policy which sort of limits expats to a three-year stint and then they must replace themselves with a local. So there's, there's that kind of stuff we do. And then also with our um, entrepreneurship and SME um, uh, development, we actually provide financial skills, business skills alongside the lending we do. 
and that's just really a, a risk mitigation, if you want to call it that, and try and you know build the market by supporting them as you as you lend to them. Vickers, you um, you've been working in education for a, you know, a very long time. You, you talk a lot about the quality of education when I read your your, your recent work, and 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 also you, know, you focus on uh, one of the programs you're focusing on in Ghana, I believe, is is about educating women. What are you, your views on education and the, the role that technology can play in in driving you know, skills growth and and, and 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 making African workers and, and, and students more competitive through technology? Thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, like I said in my article that appeared yesterday, that if South Africa, for example, or Ghana, um, provided a basic level of education to all of its children, uh, students in schools, you'll see in South Africa at least uh, something, like a, something like a two and a half thousand percentage growth in your economic activity. Um, and that's quite significant. So when we, when we see uh, people um, in the opening plenary, for example, the president of South Africa or of Ghana, speak about uh, economic growth, um, you know, the question that I pose to people is, well, how much focus is there on education systems? Um, and one of the key things I think that needs to happen is the involvement of the private sector. And that's why I attend the World Economic Forum and the different summits to talk to business leaders like Stephen and others to see how we can engage more meaningfully uh, with education systems. Uh, I think that's a really important part of making sure that skills development just doesn't happen in the workplace, but also there's a focus at school level as to how this happens. A question to both of you, how joined up is the public and, and private sector and the foundations that we're a multi-stakeholder universe? How well are we working together? I mean, I, I think people in this room and on our audience online mm -hmm. get the fact that you know, there needs to be greater public-private cooperation. Problems and challenges are too large to be solved by any one particular actor. So there's a definitely uh, a realisation that what needed to happen is more cooperation. But how joined up is that cooperation? Are we there yet? Are we seeing good working models for public-private sure. cooperation? Sure. I think, um, actually, not to embarrass them, but I think Barclays do a phenomenal job in this space in their life skills program, which I'm familiar with from the UK. Um, but however, when you look at the case of the private sector engaging with the education sector, I think it's woeful. Uh, when you come to the World Economic Forum, I think business leaders stand up and say that, um, you know, skills, jobs, these are very important things. We can't find the human capital to drive our, our businesses further. And yet, can I ask you how many education ministers attended the World Economic Forum? Probably none. And I know this is a slight criticism of, uh, of you, Oliver, in that sense. But I think it's a very important point. We actually conducted a study called Business Max Education. It's a campaign that we, uh, that we led. And what we found, based upon Brookings, Brookings research from 2011, the private sector, just from its corporate social responsibility pool, spends 16 times more on global healthcare than it does on global education. And so the question is, in terms of why is, why is that happening? And, um, and, you know, when you think about what the likes of Bill Gates have been doing, you, you know, it's about leadership that's been provided to healthcare, global healthcare. And so then the next question that arises is, who is the Bill Gates of education? And you immediately realize that that's really a dumb question to ask because we need a hundred, you need a thousand Bill Gates out there to actually push the conversation on. And that's what the campaign is about. We want business leaders to come on board and say, yes, we back education. And the one commitment and the one ask that we have is from their corporate social responsibility programs that they have, ring fence 20% for global education in the areas that it's needed the most. Now, if, you, if companies were to do that, we'd raise another two and a half, three billion dollars just from the Fortune 500. Just imagine if that applied to all the companies in the world. Uh, I think it'd be a great campaign. And I know that Barclays have supported us, uh, which I'm thankful for. And Stephen, yourself, any, any, any of you, so you've just, uh, your, your, your own efforts or your bank's efforts have just been uh, lauded by, by, by Vic Espo. It's not um, often that happens to <laughs> no, in, Indeed. Uh, but from your perspective, could you see any, any better potential for, yeah, for greater cooperation or better, more effective models for working to make sure that the, the gaps, the, the right gaps are addressed in the right order? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Vicus. There's a lot more we can do, and it's becoming more and more important because as the sort of, as digitalization happens, and robotics and you know new technology comes in, we really have to upskill um, the masses into the next level. Otherwise, they're going to find it more and more difficult to be productive and actually have a job. And so, um, I think it's incumbent on um, every corporate and every government to really put this in you know um, centre focus. And it's 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 something we recognise uh, as 
as banks digitalize and you know that we will need to upskill our staff and um, so you know we have this view is that if you come in as a teller you must leave with a degree and if you come in with a degree you must leave with a postgrad etc and uh, that's a key focus on us what's what's interesting though now and this is where i really think we can make a difference is that we do a lot of these training courses for our staff and in the past, it all had to be, you know, classroom-based, which wasn't scalable. But with uh, digital technology now, there's nothing to stop us putting that on a platform and just, you know, putting it out there for people to use. Um, and so, you know, that's where we're heading now. And uh, you know, hopefully, over time, we'll we'll really make a difference, just allowing people to to use what we've done for our staff, just generally. I mean, and this makes good business sense. In terms of public-private cooperation, is it just, it, does it make sense just to do this on your own, to just look at the, the shortcomings, for want of a better word, of, 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 of public education and then add on to, you know, to suit your, according to your needs? Or is there, is there a model or, or a need, you think, for actually you know, closer working together? Vikas, maybe. Well, if you th I think the biggest thing that the private sector can bring is its disruptive nature to education. Uh, and I don't say that lightly. If you look at everything else in the world over the 200 years, the past 202 years has changed. Apart from education systems, we still address classrooms in exactly the same way that they have been done. And so what the private sector has demonstrated time and time again is its ability to disrupt. And I think that's a really important thing that they can bring. I, I tell you one practical example that when we go around the world speaking to school leaders in particular saying, what would meaningful engagement with the private sector look like for you? And they say, they often say to us, actually, we would like businesses to come into schools and speak to our children about careers advice. You know, uh, when I was growing up in London, we had a woeful careers advisory service, and we still do, apparently. And this theme actually is, is echoed all around the world. And so if there's one thing that we can talk about is when, when you talk about the future of jobs, actually go into schools and tell them that actually, you know, these vocations that you're thinking of will not exist when you graduate. So no, let's not focus on those, but have a look at these different competencies, these different areas of growth, and you should think absolutely about how you prepare for, for the future in that way. Interesting point. I'm going to, um, I, there will be time for questions, but please allow me to indulge myself one more time. We had a, we had a gender uh, briefing earlier on today at midday, and the, um, the, the conversation centered around the fact that Afri Africa was actually a, uh, punching above its weight, as it were, compared to other regions in economic empowerment for women, but what it was failing to do was the, you know, the basics, getting health and education right. And, and Sadia Zahidi, my colleague who heads our gender, mm. gender parity efforts, made the point that we're doing a further piece of research on the future of jobs. And in fact, whilst Africa is in a, in a relatively strong position in terms of economic empowerment for women, I'm taking the, the gender angle here, um, there was a very real fear that a, a new gap could emerge as, as we see the need for, for more STEM training and, 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 uh, and, and higher value um, qualifications to cope with the changing global global environment. Would you agree, Stephen? Well, if you if if you have a look at the nature of it uh, um, across Africa, and certainly what I've seen across our countries is um, what's coming out of university is very gender equal, and um, that needs to move further and further down uh, because uh, if we don't harness the whole workforce, you're never going to get the productivity and the change you need. So for me, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's actually a maths thing, if I can put it that way, um, that we have to get right, because otherwise we're not really going to move into the new productive um, uh, world. So I think uh, a world where you have got gender inequality, I think you've got a problem. I mean, my personal view is, I've seen it in my own business, is that once you get that gender parity across your business and especially in your management structures, the diversity of that makes your business far more sustainable. And uh, you get you know, different views on how to do things. You get um, um, uh, um, um, a diversity of, of ideas, which I think just going back to Vickers' point, is today that disruption is, uh, is very important because if you're not on the forefront of that, someone else will be. So uh, it's, it's, I think it's an absolute business imperative at the moment. And Vickers, how are you, how are you helping driving leapfrogging in terms of, <coughs> in terms of using technology for, for education, STEM, etc.? We hear so much about it. Yeah, so um, our foundation, for example, has been uh, undertaking a project in Ghana called Making Ghanaian Girls Great 
which is uh, when you think about technology, people think about the whiz bang um, and the latest gadgets and everything. Um, actually, we use what is very steady, sturdy technology. Um, it's called VSAT technology in Ghana, where we have set up a, a, a classroom in a studio where a teacher broadcasts to 70 schools in rural Ghana. And at the school end, there are facilitators, expert facilitators that, uh, that engage the students and make sure it's interactive in terms of the learning that, that they receive. And it's a pilot project uh, funded by the Department for International Development from the UK that we, we, we are seeing promising signs of, of working. We're about to expand that program and that method to actually train teachers also. Um, in, in Ghana itself. So technology, you know, we can get carried away speaking about the latest stuff, but let's not forget also in much of Africa, paper and pencil is still the most up-to-date technology you can use, and which is missing in classrooms. So if we were to do a better job at actually providing classroom resources like that, again, this whole argument about providing a basic education, you can't really achieve that without having the infrastructure required to succeed. And so I, I, you know, I, I, I'm cautious when it comes to speaking about technology and just meaning iPads or things like that. Do we have any questions? Okay. Well, I just oh, before we close, I'll just ask one more. This is the meeting for public-private cooperation. After mm -hmm. all, we're nearing the end of the meeting. We're not quite there yet. But what's uh, what has been the your key takeaway or your your key action point coming from this meeting? It's a question to both of you, starting with you, Stephen. Well, what, what I found very encouraging is my meetings with the um, government uh, officials, the ministers, the central bank governors, is there's a much bigger um, cooperation agenda. So, for example, uh, in South Africa, we spent seven years working out a model for private-public partnership in renewable energy. And it's now accepted by the international community, the financiers, the operators, the generators, as working. And um, we're getting a lot of inward inquiry from the other countries as how do they leapfrog that, which in the, the past never really happened. Everyone wanted to boil the ocean and do their own bit. And the, the, the levels of cooperation across the countries, I think, has increased exponentially over the last four sessions I've been to. So that's been very, very encouraging for me. The second thing as well is the um, robustness with which the governments are looking to manage their economies. When you sit and have discussions with them and say, you know, what are you doing about the low oil price or the low commodity prices? What does that mean, you know, going forward? Their, their planning and their strategic ability around that is so, so much more advanced than it was five years ago. And that gives me a lot of confidence and a lot of hope that uh, we can actually get through this and you know, continue this growth spurt we've got. So I'm actually very excited uh, post this conference. The last thing, if I may, is that just having a look at the quality and the number of attendees that came this year, the, the, the global interest in Africa has, has really started to, to, to take shape and there's a lot of energy. And that itself is going to drive a lot of change in the, in the, in the, in the um, region. And that, for me, is uh, very exciting. To go back to your, your, your second point, I believe it's Annabel Gonzalez from the World Bank said yesterday that the oil price um, volatility that you know, has hit so many African economies is actually going to be a good thing. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to force policymakers to look at structural reform, whereas they may not have if, uh, if the markets had, had remained high. Do you agree? I agree, um, absolutely. Um, the, the interesting thing, going back to my first point, was is that when you have the discussions, there's a real debate. And you can see there's been a lot of thinking about this, where to next. There's a real term plan coming in, um, whereas before it would be, OK, we're going to sort ourselves out. And you, you even saw in, in, in Zambia, for example, they've changed the royalty on uh, the royalty level, level on copper mining just because the copper price has gone down. So they realize this industry is important. So the government have made a decision. And that's, you know, that is just fantastic because they're really having a look at the long-term viability of everything and trying to partner, especially around power and infrastructure, with as many um, a private sector partners as they can. And that is a huge step forward. Uh, so uh, I, I really do think the next, you know, five years you're going to see a, a lot of change 
uh, and there's a lot of opportunity for private sector to operate with, with government because they're just they're embracing it and that's fantastic. Vikas, your action points from this week's meeting. I think there are, there are three main points that actually stand out for me from this, uh, from this summit. Uh, firstly, I want to congratulate the World Economic Forum for organizing it in Cape Town again, and it has been very dynamic and it's, it's had a huge turnout and we found it very productive. Um, the vibrancy that you get in Cape Town in South Africa actually is unmatched in other Africa summits, so um, I think it's a really important thing to do it here, and you do it very well. Um, there are three things that I take away from my discussions on, on education um, that when I spoke with, with various public figures or captains of industry, um, there's that recognition that the private sector, whilst doing their own training programs in their own companies, um, I think, w which are critical and important for their supply chain and for their businesses, actually need to engage more f further down and much earlier on. I think that, that recognition, that acceptance, I think, is coming through. The, the second thing that I wanted to mention was um, everyone speaks about the skills gap that exists in Africa and um, there's an acceptance that we need to look at innovative models of finance when it comes to actually paying for this, uh, these kind of programs. And so whether you're looking at government based schemes or whether you're looking at private sector corporate training, we have to think in terms of how, how we can make sure that at the lower level, so artisan level, how we can promote skills uh, and greater skills base. And the third thing is that on the question of leadership, um, it's actually what something that Greco Michelle said was that um, uh, you know we we accept that leadership is important, but yet we cannot f we we do not see teachers as leaders, and I think that's a really important statement to make in in that. Um, in that if we expect uh, reform to happen in education systems, you cannot do them without, without teachers. And so when uh, it's a very lazy argument to say that all teachers uh, are, are not up to scratch, um, they're not doing their jobs, actually it's a massive systemic issue that we need to address. And there's a greater acceptance of that. But the reason I come back to the teacher point is that uh, we should be celebrating and we should be fighting for greater respect of teachers because they, they deliver so much at school level. So those are my three main points. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you for joining us here and thank you for our audience online. This session is now closed. <laughs>